Well, good to see you. God bless you for being here. We welcome our Cookville Life Church campus. We welcome our Sparta and Livingston and Cookville South Life Church campuses. It's so good to be with you as always, guys. Uh, no matter where you're tuning in from, different states, maybe different countries, we're so honored that you would come study the Word of God with us. And we also, all of us together, are going to give a special welcome to all of our family in the correctional facilities. Can we welcome them to church? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, we're going to continue our series. We've been talking about faith toward God, and uh, God willing, next week we'll wrap this series up. But uh, I was telling the 10 o'clock service, uh, if there's, I think all the messages that God gives us are very, very important, or he wouldn't give them to us, but I think this faith toward God, I've seen more people connect and respond to because there is a difference between faith toward God and faith in God. So let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1 says this to us. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. He's talking about the elementary principles of Christianity, the ABCs of our faith. Let's go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of, everybody say, faith toward God. So according to the Holy Spirit through this writer, that uh, elementary principle of Christianity is faith toward God. Not faith in God, but rather faith toward God. And there's a big difference. And uh, we've said nearly everyone has faith in God. If you poll the American people, the vast majority, overwhelming majority of Americans will tell you, absolutely, I believe there's a God. Absolutely, I have faith in God. But we realize that's not really causing our country to go forward, is it? No. Because see, faith in God gets us nothing from God. Faith in God it's just kind of like putting your car in neutral. Uh, it's faith toward God that puts our car in drive. And we said this, that even the demons and the devil has faith in God. Let me read it to you, James 2, 19. You believe that there is one God? You do well. You have faith in God? Great. Even the demons believe and tremble. So even the devil has faith in God. So we said if we are a person who has faith in God, but not faith toward God, we're on the level with the devil. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stay on that level. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 8 shows us what does faith in God look like. I mean, faith toward God look like. Here it is, Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, I suggest to you, he's talking about faith toward God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Why do I say it's faith toward God? The next sentence. For he who comes to God, not he or she who waits for God to come to them. For they who come to God must believe that he is so that's faith in God. But notice this. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, yes, you can believe that he is. But if you and I don't get over into that diligently seek him, then we never move into faith toward God. And it says that he will not reward us. Um, so here's what we said. And we're going to kick off on this today. But the main way that you and I demonstrate or exercise faith toward God is through our prayer. Our prayers is what takes us from faith in God to faith toward God. And we said that there's a purpose for prayer. We talked about the power of prayer, the protocol of prayer, and the persistence of prayer. And we've talked about the first two. Let me review real quickly. Number one, the purpose of prayer. What is the purpose of prayer? And it's very, very simple. Religion over the years has made it more complex than it is. He made it simple. Why? So even a bangham boy could get it. Here it is. What's the purpose of prayer? Here it is. It's to get with God so God will get with you. That's it. To get with God so God will draw near to God and he'll what? He'll draw near to you. So purpose of prayer is to get with God. So how many want God to get with you? You need God to get with you. I need God to get with me, okay? I got some stuff I need him to help me with, help my family with. So if I want God to get with me, I got to get with God. Notice this, Acts 10, 38. And you know, so listen, you already know this. You're so smart, you already know it. What? And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. So you know that the Father anointed or empowered Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was, everybody say, with him. So the reason Jesus was able to be so effective on planet Earth is because God, the Father, was with him. Now, here's the thing. Why was God with Jesus? 
We ask that question. Why was he? Because he was the second member of the Trinity? No. The reason God the Father was with Jesus because Jesus was always getting with the Father. We shared several scriptures. I'm not going to take time to turn over that. But we saw a scripture where it says, and Jesus often withdrew himself and prayed to the Father. Not occasionally, not rarely, not just when he was in trouble. It says he often withdrew into prayer. Then we saw a scripture where it says Jesus prayed into the night to his Father. Then we read another verse where it says, and Jesus rose a long while before daylight to get with his Father and pray to the Father. And then we saw a scripture where it says, and Jesus prayed all night until the next morning to the Father. Listen, the reason God was with Jesus is because Jesus was always getting with God. So number one, prayer is to get God's attention. And if you and I want to get God's attention, we got to give him ours. Number two, we talked about the power of prayer. I'm, I'm telling you, and I'm reminding me, that the most powerful thing we possess is our access to the most powerful being in the universe. See, I'm all for, I was college minister for many years, I'm all for education. I think you should give yourself every advantage you can in life. I'm all for working hard and experiencing promotion at work. I'm all for those things. But I'm telling you, those things will never take you as far in life as having the favor of the Father on your life. And the way you and I get that is through our prayer life, okay? And we said this, there are people on planet Earth that can do big favors for you. I mean, anywhere from fixing a speeding ticket to a presidential pardon. Why? Because they have powerful positions, but you know their power is still limited. They can only do so much. Uh, it's kind of like this. Ask old Mo, Moses. He found himself between a rock and a hard place. He found himself between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army that was coming to kill him. And what did God do? God said, look out, Mo. <laughs> and he blew the waters apart, and they walked through on dry land. See, the president can't do that. The king can't do it, but God can do that. You need to get to know him. You need to get to know him. Ask Joshua about, about this God. Joshua, the Bible says, he and the children of Israel was in the fight for their life. They were in a battle. And the Bible says if the sun had gone down and it become night, that Israel would have been overtaken and destroyed. So what did Joshua do? Because he had a covenant of God, he prayed to, to the Father, and he said, Son, stand still. And the Bible tells us that the sun stood still for a whole day. You know, now that we understand a little bit more about science and our universe, that means that the whole universe stopped. You need to get to know him. He can do some big favors for you. But see, you have not because you ask not. So prayer is number one. The purpose of prayer is to, to get God's attention and to get his. You got to give him yours. Number two, it's the most powerful thing we have uh, in our possession. Number three, this is where we're at today, the protocol of prayer. I didn't know for years that there is a protocol to prayer. And if you study the scriptures, you will learn this. And so let's look at it this way. When you're meeting with a king, when someone, if you read history, uh, uh, hundreds of years ago, we had a lot more kings on the earth. But when you would meet with a king, you entered in with respect and honor and adoration. Matter of fact, we still have King Charles in the UK. Now, the government's changed some. Now they have a prime minister, but they're still the royal family. And, and it was the, the queen, Elizabeth, was for 70 years reigned. And you know what's interesting is if you, if you read about it, that even though the prime minister was the president, if you will, of the country, that whoever got elected, and still to this day, Whoever gets elected as prime minister, they have to sit and be taught how to enter in to King Charles's presence now. And they go in and they say something such as, your highness or, or your majesty. Now, I've been working with my assistant, Janetta, on this. And uh, <laughs> somehow, I'm not teaching good or she's not learning good. I'll go in, I'll say, now, which one are we going to use today? Your majesty, majesty or your highness? And she said, well, really, what I'm wanting to use, I can't say. <laughs> she has no respect for the mayor of Bangham here. <laughs> but we need to understand something here, guys, in all seriousness. We need to understand something. God is not just our father. He's a king. Matter of fact, he's not just a king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us how to approach him. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with 
praise, with adoration and admiration. Be thankful to him and bless his name. See, I do agree with people who, I hear people teach on prayer and, and phenomenal teachers. And I believe they're accurate when they say, hey, when you go in before God, just tell him where you're at. He, tell him how you feel about things. And, and it's a conversation with God. And I agree with that to a point. Here's what I mean by that. I've heard people teach, hey, if you're mad at God and you just, you, I mean, you're just angry, just go in and tell him how you feel to a point. Okay, I, I mean that, to a point. Don't forget to respect him. He is the king after all. He did give you and I life after all. And so I think we can become irreverent if we're not careful. Does that make sense? I was with a guy one time and I was 12 or 13 years old and he was a logger and I was earning some money and so I was out there working with him and his bulldozer broke. And this guy comes off that bulldozer and looks up at the sky and starts cussing God. And you blankety blank blank and I don't know why you hate me so blankety blank much and I'm just going, mm. <laughs> Listen, he's a big dude to cuss at. But how disrespect, does that make sense? And he wonders why his life is never good. Well, you can't curse the one who gave you life and your life be well. So my point is, we can't forget, yes, he's our father, but he's also the king of kings. So there's a protocol into coming before his presence. Now, let me show you, Jesus talked about it in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, very familiar. We all know this. Now, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to go before the Father, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, so I'm going to tell you how to approach the Father, guys. Listen up. It's Jesus when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Make sure that when you come in, you're hallowing, you're respecting, you're honoring. He's the king, maker of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of lords. Make sure you approach my Father with respect. There's a protocol to come in before his presence. See, like I said, it, there's a protocol when meeting with a king. There's a protocol with meeting with the president of the United States. My nephew has been in the Secret Service right at 20 years now. He was Secret Service protection for President Bush, President Obama, President Trump, and now President Biden. And he will tell you, there's a protocol when you go in to meet with the President of the United States. You don't just slide in and go, hey, dude, what's up? Give me five. You don't do that. Matter of fact, you're searched before you go in and meet with the President of the United States. There's just certain things you can't bring in when you meet with him. Did you know that there's certain things we can't bring in when we're meeting with our Father? There's certain things you're gonna have to keep outside. Let me show you, I'll share two of them with you. Number one, the first thing we are not allowed to bring into God's presence, the protocol, is doubt. You can bring it in, but if you do, you leave with nothing. Let me prove it to you. James chapter one, verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, stop. It could be anything. If you lack peace, if you lack joy, if, if you're hurting financially, if you lack health, because we know God answers all, right? But this is, he's talking about if you lack wisdom in a certain area. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. First thing he wants you to know is our God's a giver. He loves to give to his children, loves it. But notice the next word, but. Everybody say, but. The big bud always gets in the way, don't it? Even though God's a big giver and he loves to give, but what? Let him ask in faith. Notice this now, with no doubting. How much doubting? None. Leave it outside, he said. Leave that outside. Why? Because you're going to attack my integrity. You come in here with doubt. So no doubting. Notice this now. For he who doubts, you could say he or she who doubts, is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man... What? The one who's doubting, suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. So when we, the protocol to come in before the Father is yes, come in with adoration and admiration, but also you got to come in in faith. No doubting. It's not allowed in his presence. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing, and I want to spend some time on this one, because I think we believe that we've got to come in faith. We've been taught enough of that, but this is the one that I think trips up most people. What I'm about to tell you is why I believe most, uh, many people, many people don't get their prayers answered. Because what I'm about to tell you, we still think it's optional. 
we still think it's up. Here, here's what it is. Unforgiveness. Can't bring it in. Can't bring it in. He will not have a conversation with you if you and I have unforgiveness in our hearts. And I'm gonna prove it to you. Matthew chapter five, verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, what's that? You're coming before God. And there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. This is Jesus talking. I didn't get up and make this up this morning. Let me read it to you in the message translation. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these manners. If you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering and you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately. Get out of my presence. Immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work out things with God. You know what God's saying? When y'all start speaking, me and you can start speaking. Now listen, you can't affect what the other person does. If they, listen, forgiveness, you can do all by yourself. Reconciliation takes two. He didn't say go reconcile. He said go forgive. Reconciliation will take both parties. But what he's saying is you gotta make sure your heart's right. So you know what God's saying? If you go to him in prayer and there's another brother or sister in the Lord that you're still angry with or you've not forgiven, Here's what God's saying. If you won't speak to them, don't speak to me. That's tough. Because we still think, yeah, I know that. No, 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 no. Let me show you Mark eleven twenty four. 24. This is the famous faith scripture. We love this. Notice, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe you receive them and you'll have them. Stop, look up here. Man, we love that. I get up here and tell you, man, faith is kingdom currency. If you want something from God, you got to go in there and you believe you receive when you pray. God, I know you're able and I know you're willing and I believe I receive one. And I think most people believe that, but they stop right there and God doesn't stop right there. Notice the next word, and. Everybody say, and. and. So this makes that conditional. And whenever you stand praying, if you have, now listen to this. I'm talking to you. I ain't talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to you. Jesus is talking to you. If you have anything against anyone, I'm gonna say it again. If you have anything against anyone, one more time. If you have anything against anyone, yeah, but you don't know what they did. He said anything against anyone. Yeah, but they did anything against anyone. Notice this, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Do we really believe that? We say amen, we say we do, but we still don't do it. Well, pastor, you don't know what they did. Let me say it again. Anything against anyone. Love yourself enough to forgive. Love yourself, why? Because God's saying, until you speak to them, don't speak to me. Why? Because even though you have a problem with one of God's children, he still loves them. If you got more than one kid in the house, you know exactly what I'm talking to you. When your kids fight and fuss, it robs all the peace in the home, don't it? So he says, if you've got anything against anyone, you get that right, and then me and you can get it going on. This is the one I believe where most prayers are not getting answered, guys. I really believe this. We think this is optional. Let me talk about me, because I'm right there with you. About seven years ago, and I haven't talked about this in a long time because God's done a lot of healing in me. About seven years ago, I was betrayed by someone very close to me, and it devastated me. I'm not saying I did everything right in it, but I was devastated. I never would have dreamed. See, I, I'd been pretty, pretty spoiled up to that point. I've always kind of got along with people, and people, I'm not saying I've never had odds with people, but never this kind of just hatred and just downright betrayal. And it, it messed me up. Um, it messed me up, not just spiritually, but emotionally, and even it started affecting me physically. Now listen, I knew I had to forgive. It's not optional, I knew. And see, forgiveness is not about how you feel, it's about your will. You choose to forgive. But I kept playing that thing over and over in my mind. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It wasn't my heart so much as it was my mind. I needed my mind to hook up with my heart because I would forgive and I would pray for this individual and then 30 minutes later, I'm thinking about what they did again. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
it started making me sick. I physically got, I had to be put in a hospital one time. And it was re directly re related to this. Why? My blood pressure got up to where it was 185, 190, over 115, and we couldn't get it to go down. Unforgiveness will kill you. It will make you sick. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how do I do this? And through the help of God, his word, and some godly people, God was able to help me do this. Here's what I mean by that. I had to refocus. Jesus said the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, your focus is good, your whole body be full of light. But if your eye is bad or your focus is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. How great is that? I would forgive, but then I'd get my focus back on, why would he, why would he do that? Why would he say that? Why would he try to hurt me like that? Why, why? And what God was able to help me do is get, remember it says, look unto Jesus, the author and finish your faith. And here's what happened. I began to get my focus off of what he was doing to me, and I got my focus back on what he had done for me. See, every day you got a choice to make. We got a choice to make. You can get up and focus on what somebody's done to you, or you can focus on what he's done for you. And let me tell you something. If you'll get your focus right, you'll come to realize what he did for you is greater than anything anybody can ever do to you. Do you hear me? Love yourself enough. For you. See, you can't hook up to what God's got for you until you unhook from what they've done to you. And so that's what God helped me to do. You ever heard of Corey Ten Boone? Corey Ten Boone was a, a prisoner of a concentration camp. Her family was Jewish. Her and her sister was put in this concentration camp, and they were beaten and raped over and over and over. Her sister died in that concentration camp. Corey made it out. She's a Christian. She was teaching Jesus in Colosseums, preaching the gospel. But she said, in my heart, I had forgiven Father, forgive them. They don't know what to do. She said, but in my, my mind would play over and over the torture we, me and my sister went through. I could picture them doing what they did to my sister. I could picture the men's faces. And so I'd forgive, but this would just play over and over in my mind. And she said, finally, I wrote a letter. This is in her biography. She wrote a letter to a Lutheran pastor and told him the dilemma she was in. She said, from my heart, I forgive, but my mind, I play it over and over. And he said, he wrote her a letter back and he said, Corey, there's a steeple in my church. There's a bell in that steeple, but there's a rope tied to the bell. And if you take your hand and you pull on the rope, as long as you pull on the rope, that bell will ring. He said, but when you let go of the rope, the bell will still ring for a little while, but it'll get fainter and fainter and fainter until you don't hear it ring no more. He said, Corey, you got to let go over the rope. You got to let go. And see, what she was doing is she would get her focus back on, I forgive, but yeah, but look what they did. That's exactly what God did for me. And I let go of the rope. Listen, some of you need to let go of the rope. If you want to grab hold of what God's got for you, you got to unhook and quit grabbing hold of what they did to you. Protocol, you can't bring that into God's presence. He will not, he will not converse with you until you get that right. Now listen, you can't change them, but you allow God to change you. Let me show you this. So the Bible's very clear. Without faith, our prayers will not get answered. But the Bible's also clear. Faith without forgiveness will hinder our prayers. Notice this scripture, Galatians 5, 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Notice this now. But faith which worketh by love. See, faith don't work without love. See, some of us say, man, I need more faith. Maybe you need more love. Because faith works by love. If your, if your love ain't working, your faith ain't working. Uh, let me show you this scripture. 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Notice this now. This is powerful. Listen to this. Treat her as you should, treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Which means if we don't treat her as we should, our prayers will be hindered. That goes both ways. Matter of fact, it's not just a husband and wife. If I don't treat you as I should, God's saying, he's not going to hear my prayer. See, the horizontal does affect the vertical. And we've dismissed the two. Well, I can still have a problem with this person and still be okay with him. Not according to him. Faith worketh by love. When I first got married, I really stunk at this. I moved out of my mom and dad's house when I was 17. So I spent years living by myself. And... When I married Jennifer and she moved in, now I share the toothpaste. It's amazing what little stupid things can do. 
Because see, with toothpaste, you don't squeeze it from the middle. You squeeze it from the end. You know what I'm saying? How hard is that? No, how, how, how hard is that? I became an idiot though, seriously. I became an idiot. I would take things like that and just, and when she didn't do what I wanted her to do, I'd pout. You ain't getting none of this. <laughs> that was not really bothering her, to be honest with you. <laughs> but anybody know what I'm talking about? I was a baby. I was a baby. Well, God wasn't okay with that. So what he did one day is he just bent me over his knee and just spanked my little booty. And he said, that girl you're treating like that is my daughter. You're ticking me off. But I was going to go into his presence treating her like that. Oh, I love you, Lord. Praise God. And he's like, put your hand down and shut up until you go in there and talk to her. And get it right. I'm just telling you, it's not optional, folks. How I treat you affects mine and his relationship. A couple married for 15 years began having more than usual disagreements. They wanted to make their marriage work and agreed on an idea the wife had. For one month, they planned to drop a slip in a thought box. The boxes would provide a place to let the other know about daily irritations. The wife was diligent in her efforts and approach, leaving the jelly top off the jar, wet towels on the shower floor, dirty socks in the hamper, not shutting the cabinet doors, and on and on until the end of the month. After dinner, at the end of the month, they exchanged boxes. The husband was continually reflecting on what he had done wrong for the month. The wife opened her box and began reading. They were all the same. The message on each slip was, I love you. Take that home, girls. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it can go both ways, can it, girls? You know what he was saying? This is biblical. For every fault, he was covering it with, I love you. See, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, Love keeps no record of wrong. You know what some of us are real good at? Keeping records. We keep records. Even those of us that ain't good in administrators. We got that little record book. I remember when he did this. I remember when she did that. And we go around all day long just evaluating how people treat us. Can I, let me, let me set you free a minute. Nobody's gonna like you like you do. Did you hear me? People are not going to get up tomorrow morning and think about you the first thing. And how can I treat them today? They don't think like that because they're thinking about themselves. Are you listening to me? The people that I know in life that keep good records on how people treat them are the most miserable people on planet earth. Are you listening to me? Well, he did this and she did that and she did. We might not be hysterical, but we're pretty historical. Well, he did this and he did that. And he said, hey, love keeps no records of wrong. The people that I know that focus on others more than themselves are the happiest people on planet earth. Let's listen to this scripture, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Most of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers sin. You know, actually, if we just get honest, I'm talking about me, I'm not picking on you, but we don't mind uncovering somebody else's sin, but we want to make sure everybody covers ours. Isn't that hypocr hypocrisy? We'll, we'll throw the sheet off and say, look what, he, look what she did. Can you, can you believe? Hey, let's pray for them, but I want to tell you what they did first. We like to uncover people's sin, but now when somebody uncovers ours, woo, come on. What am I trying to say to you? What I'm trying to say to you and I both is there's a protocol when it comes to prayer. How we approach God with honor and adoration. He's a king, but also what we can and cannot bring into his presence. And he says, don't bring doubt in here. But also, don't you bring unforgiveness in here. Because I'm a forgiver. Aren't we glad he's a forgiver? Amen. So the first protocol of prayer is what we can and cannot bring in. The second, and this one's going to be quick, I promise. The second protocol of prayer is about, not about what we can and can bring in, but how we come in. Notice this, John 16, 23. And in that day, let me stop, tell you what he's talking about. There's a day that was coming that he was telling them about. He said, in that day, now what day is he talking about? I'm going to show you. He was talking about when he dies on the cross and he's resurrected and he goes back to the Father. That's the day he's talking about. Now notice, in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most surely I say whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've not asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Listen to what Jesus was teaching them. See, before that day he's talking about, they had to always go to Jesus 
for help. Hey, Jesus, this man can't walk. Can you go heal him? Hey, Jesus, these people are hungry. Can you give them something to eat? Hey, Jesus, this person's sick. Can you open their blind eyes? He said, but in that day, what? The day that I die and bring you and the Father back, you don't have to come to me anymore. You can do it in my name. That's the day. I'm gonna explain what I mean by that to you. But we're talking about the protocol of prayer, how we go in. See, for years I didn't know that we don't pray to Jesus. We pray through Jesus. Now, you're not wrong if you talk to Jesus. Yesterday in my living room, I was just, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Thank you for dying on the cross. I sing songs to Jesus. But when it comes to prayer and receiving in prayer, Jesus said in that day, what, the day I reconcile you to the Father, you don't come to me no more. You come through me to the Father. Does that make sense, guys? So it's not biblical to pray to Jesus. It's biblical to pray through Jesus to the Father. Let me show you this. I'm gonna skip down, guys, to John 15. John 15, 16. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you asked, everybody say the Father. The Father in my name, he may give you. He's saying, you're not gonna ask me no more. You're not gonna pray to me. You're gonna pray through me to the Father. So let me, let me sum it up with this. At salvation, the moment we, you and I accept Christ, we are immediately married to the Lord Jesus. We become the bride of Christ at that moment. It's a, let me put it this way. The cross is the most expensive engagement ring that's ever been purchased. The cross was Jesus saying, will you marry me? The cross is him getting down on one knee and saying, here's my engagement ring. What do we have to do after that? At salvation, we just say, I do. I do. At that moment, though, the moment you and I receive him, we then become married to him and we take his name. Just like on August the 14th, 1992, Jennifer Stewart took the name Jennifer Davis. And here's what Jesus is trying to teach us. When Jennifer took my name, she also took my checkbook. <laughs> That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. See, the checkbook comes with the name. Give you, let me give you an illustration to explain this. So you've got a single mom. She's got four kids. Her husband's left her. Doesn't help her at all financially. She's working full-time and even took a part-time job on the weekends to try to provide for her and those kids, but she still keeps getting behind. Feeding them, paying the rent, paying the electric, trying to clothe them for school. I mean, she's doing everything she can, but every month she has to put more on the credit card, more on the credit, until she finally maxes out her credit card. But something happens. This lady, this single mom, meets a gentleman. And not only is he pretty good looking, but he's wealthy, which makes him better looking. <laughs> so they start dating. And what happens is when they start dating, he takes her to restaurants that she was never able to go to before. He winds and down her. He takes her to restaurants where she's never seen service like this. Then he takes her to very expensive stores and buys her outfits and buys her jewelry. And then he takes her to stores and he buys all of her kids clothes for school. And she's never experienced anything like that. But something happens. They go from dating to they get married. Now, the day they get married, she not only took his name, but his credit is now her credit. She don't have to have him to go to the restaurant. She can go on her own and take her friends with her. <laughs> she can go straight to the restaurant in his name. See, when he married her, the first thing he did is paid off all of her debt. See, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. In that day, I'm gonna pay off all your debt. See, you have no credit in heaven before Christ. We're bankrupt. But the moment we marry Jesus Christ, he pays off all of our debt, all of our debt, and then his credit becomes our credit. And he says, now you can go straight to the Father in my name. Just like that lady can go straight to the store in that man's name and get whatever she wants. Why? Because his credit is our... If we'll ever get a hold of this, mm, notice this. Romans 8, verse 16. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts. Spirit of God speaking to you if you're a child of God. And listen to what he's speaking. And tells us that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we will share his treasures. For ev everybody say everything. everything. Everybody say everything. everything. For everything God gives to his son Christ is ours too. Do we really believe that? Jesus said in that day, what? The day that he went up to heaven and, and became our substitute. He said in that day, when you kneel down to pray to the Father, it's just like me kneeling down to pray to the Father. See, we would think, 
well, man, if Jesus would come down and kneel down beside me, the Father would really hear him. Then you're still missing it. That's still like saying that, la that lady has to go get her husband to go to the store with him. No, she don't. She don't need him. She can go in his name now. What Jesus is saying is, you have the same credit with God that I have. Amen. Why? Because you're married to me now. And everything the Father would give me, he'll give you. His credit is our credit. Let me say something. That's why Hebrews 4, 16 says, because now who you're married to, come boldly into the throne of grace. See, once, Jesus, once Jeannie took my name, because I was making more money than she was at the time, once she took my name, she went boldly to Belk. <laughs> boldly. She didn't go, uh, should I or should Do you think they'll take? I'll take that and that. Thank you very much. Matter of fact, you can even wrap it. Jesus is saying, because you're married to me, you're no longer bankrupt. You're loaded. Spiritually, you're loaded. Why? Because you got my name. And because you got my name, your name is now on my account. So the protocol of prayer. So number one, the purpose of prayer is to get with God so God will get with us. The power of prayer. We have access to the most powerful being in the universe. He's just saying, come on in. And the protocol of prayer. What's the protocol? Number one, we're coming before a king. So we enter in with adoration and admiration. But the protocol also is there are certain things you can't take before the president of the United States. You have to leave it outside. There's things we can't take into God's presence. We can't take doubt and we cannot take unforgiveness. Love yourself enough to forgive. And then the third thing is we don't pray to Jesus. We pray through Jesus. Now we can love on Jesus and sing to Jesus, but we go to the Father in his name on his account. Amen? Stand up with me. Next week, we're gonna talk about the persistence of prayer. And I'll just tell you this. What we're gonna find out next week is some of us have given up too, quick, too quickly. He's gonna tell us how we get our prayers answered through persistence. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, that we have your name. Wow, what a great God you are. Lord, I ask you to speak to the, to the people today. If there's anybody that's not where they need to be with you, may they make that right today. Head bowed and eyes closed. Question we ask every week, but here it is. Where are you at with Jesus? Where are you at with Jesus? It's the most important thing in your life. The Bible says when we die, when your heart stops, my heart stops, we're gonna be, be immediately in the presence of the Lord. And he's gonna say one of two things to us. Either depart from me, I don't know you, or enter into the joy of the Lord. How do I hear enter in, Pastor Bob? By saying I do. Jesus has already proposed. He's already died on the cross. He's already said, hey, will you marry me? Will you be mine? All he's waiting for you to do is say, I do. Now listen, if you've never said I do, you need to do that. But maybe some of you were arrived at that and you need to renew your vows. You've just been doing your own thing for a while. You prayed to Jesus once before, but it's time to renew your vows. Either one of those, I wanna lead you in a prayer. And if that's you, no matter where you're at, I want you by a signal to heaven, would you just raise your hand toward God and say, that's me. I wanna make sure, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Praise God, amen. Praise Jesus. Listen, Jesus died for this moment. This is what it's all about. So no matter where you're at, we're gonna exchange vows with Jesus this morning, and I want you to repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me, and I believe God raised you from the dead. Cleanse me with your blood from all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord, my Savior, my King. I say, I do, in Jesus' name. Amen. We celebrate with you. Amen.